Maths is a part of our everyday lives, at least to some extent. While some people may not particularly care for maths, we almost all use it daily, even if it's just sometimes as simple as counting. One of the great things about basic maths that we rely on is it's usually simple and intuitive. And the fantastic thing about extremely advanced maths is that most of us are never going to use it. So. It doesn't matter how confusing it is. However, there are some things in the world of mathematics that go counter to our instincts. They are things that seem like they should be simple and straightforward, but the actual answers are so shocking that we struggle to believe they're actually true. From exponential growth and probability all the way through to infinity and beyond. Today we're going to look at five of the most contested maths facts that most people simply can't believe. The birthday problem, also sometimes referred to as the birthday paradox, is what is known as a vertical paradox. This is a type of paradox where the initial statement sounds immediately absurd, if not impossible, yet it can be verified as true. The birthday problem is usually attributed to English mathematician Harold Davenport in the 1920s, though Davenport never claimed credit for the discovery because, somewhat ironically, he found it absurd, if not impossible, that nobody else had published this specific result. So. What is it? Well, let's say you have a room full of people and you wanted to calculate the odds that two people in that room would share a birthday. How many people would it take for there to be a greater than 50% chance of two people having been born on the same day? Now, to keep things simple, we're going to assume that every day is equally likely to be somebody's birthday and that the leap year doesn't exist. There are 365 days in a year, so it would take 366 people for a 100% chance that two of them share a birthday. Now that much is true, and intuitively you might assume then that it would take 183 people for there to be a 50% chance that two were born on the same day. However, the actual number is only 23. If there are 23 people in a room, there is a 50% chance that two of them share a birthday. Now let me interrupt today's video to talk a bit about our fantastic sponsor today, and that is our old friends at Surfshark VPN. Now look, privacy is a huge deal for just about everybody. We all need our private time, and we like to think that we can just go online, look up what we like, and not have to worry about data being seen or leaked by anyone. And on top of that, sometimes you just want to go to a website or watch something on, say, Netflix, but it's region locked, which is a hassle. It's a pain in the ass. But with Surfshark VPN, you don't have to worry about things like that any longer. Traveling abroad and want your Netflix selection from back home? Want access to blocked websites that you normally wouldn't have issue accessing? Just tap on Surfshark and you get exactly what you're looking for. Block sites are no longer an issue and your Netflix selection just doubled as a result. Now we mentioned your safety earlier, your privacy being violated by pesky data leak as well. No more. Clean web, multi-op and IP rotator are all things included in your subscription, keeping your data under lock and key. Encryption and safety is the name of the game here and Surfshark has that in spades. The best part? Just change your regional location and in a snap you no longer have to worry about inflated prices based on your device or where you are. And on top of that you can share your subscription with anyone you want as Surfshark can run on multiple devices all at once. Protection, accessibility, all at a great price. Surfshark has it all and is worth every penny. Enter promo code SIDEPROJECTS for an extra three months for free at surfshark.deal slash SIDEPROJECTS. Secure your internet today with Surfshark. Thank you to them for sponsoring and now back to today. Video. One of the reasons this seems so immediately unlikely is that people tend to view the problem with respect to themselves. If you are in that room of 23 people, the odds that one of those 22 other people would have the same birthday as you is incredibly small. But it's not all about you, which is what makes these results possible. Because every person has to be checked against every other person's birthday, there are hundreds of comparisons being made rather than just 22. To calculate exactly how many of these comparisons are going to be made, we first select any of the 23 people and then match them against any of the 22 remaining people. Multiplying 23 by 22 gives us 506. Then we divide by 2 because comparing Abby's birthday to Ben's birthday is the same as comparing Ben's birthday to Abby's birthday. So, with 23 people in the room, there are 253 different birthday comparisons being made, resulting in just over a 50% chance that there will be two that share the same birthday. It seems impossible at first that with 365 possible days and only 23 people that two would be born on the same day, but you've actually probably seen this play out yourself. 
The average classroom size in a United States public school is 24, so there's an above average chance that at some point you had a class with two people who shared the same birthday. The probability increases quickly with more people as well. At 30 people it jumps to over 70%, and at 50 people it's already 97% likely that two will share a birthday. With 70 people, it becomes 99.9%, .9%, making it almost guaranteed. Of course, if we consider matching the group of people against a specific date rather than any of them sharing any birthday, then the odds become much more along the lines of what you would expect. It would take 253 people for there to be a 50% chance that one of them had the same birthday as you specifically. That's a bit higher than the 183 people you might have guessed, but there's a good chance that many of those people would share birthdays with one another, which pushes the number of people that you would need higher. Three hundred and seventy-nine pages to prove one plus one equals two. Now there are certain things in maths that appear to be axiomatically true. In fact, that's the very foundation of maths. These axioms are the rules of maths, which are then used to build theorems that can act as more rules. It all builds on itself, making the axioms extremely important. There are also things that are true by definition, and 1 plus 1 equals 2 has largely been included among those things. Just needed to define the symbols used in terms of Arabic numerals. But for thousands of years, nobody bothered to create a formal proof of this simple arithmetic. However, over time, many different branches of maths were created, each with their own axioms. In ancient times, when there was only geometry and arithmetic, this was fine. But as more advanced maths was developed, such as calculus and set theory, the different sets of rules for different branches of maths began creating paradoxes with one another. This reached a breaking point in the 1800s with the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. Euclid had written five axioms for geometry. The first four were simple, such as you can draw a straight line through two points and all right angles are equal. However, Euclid's fifth axiom had bothered mathematicians for over a thousand years. It said that for any given point on a given line, there is exactly one line through the point that is parallel to the given line. It was much more complicated than the other axioms, and it seemed like it should have been provable as a theorem. But not only could nobody prove this fact, non-Euclidean geometry contradicted it entirely. With more and more paradoxes emerging, British mathematicians Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell decided that they were going to fix everything. They were going to rebuild all existing branches of maths using a single set of rules based on logic and set theory, and it was going to unify everything. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. It's a pretty wild story involving a love triangle and a publisher telling them that their book didn't look like it was meant to be read by humans, but the final result was the three volumes of Principia Mathematica being published in 1910, 1912, and 1913. The book started at the absolute lowest level, defining every symbol, number, and function through a complex series of confusing and archaic symbols. But because the two authors wanted their new system to be as rigorous and paradox-free as possible, they painstakingly attempted to build all of maths up from the most basic logic there was. And it turns out that while 1 plus 1 equals 2 seems painfully obvious to us, it's based on a number of assumptions. For example, what is the quantity 1, and how can we describe it in the most unambiguous terms using a language of pure logic? The same goes for the number 2, and the equals and plus signs. It took 379 pages of seemingly incoherent nonsense that the authors were finally able to state, from this proposition it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Addition wasn't actually finished being defined until page 86 of the second volume, over 750 pages into the work. Unfortunately for Whitehead and Russell, less than two decades later, Gödel's incompleteness theorems would essentially disprove the claims that Principia Mathematica could serve as a complete, unbreakable foundation for all future maths. That's probably okay, though, seeing as the world was doing just fine when we accepted that 1 plus 1 equals 2 without needing an unwieldy proof of it. Besides, by the author's own admission, by the time their efforts were negated, only about six other people had even read their book. This seems particularly unusual at first glance, even though we all understand that two things that look different can have the same value. For example, 7 minus 3 and 2 squared both equal 4, despite looking very different. However, those examples both contain some sort of arithmetic function. 
One uses subtraction, and the other has multiplication masquerading as an exponent. However, 0.9 recurring and 1 are both written as just numbers, so how can they possibly have the same value? Well, there are several different ways to prove that these numbers are really the same thing. We'll look at the most common proof, though it's not the most complicated. Let's say that 0.9 recurring equals x. If we multiply both sides by 10, we get 9.9 .9 recurring equals 10x. Subtract x, which equals 0.9 recurring from both sides, and the result is 9 equals 9x, so x equals 1. Now, this might feel strange, almost like one of those fake proofs that shows 1 equals 0, but those fake proofs rely on tricks like dividing by 0. Still, there are easier ways to prove that these numbers are the same. Both 0.9 recurring and 1 are real numbers rather than imaginary numbers. A fun fact about real numbers is that between every two different real numbers, there is an infinite number of other real numbers. Let's take 1 and 2 as an example. Between those, we also have the numbers 0 0.1, 0 0.11, 0 0.111, and an infinite array of other numbers. But what numbers could fit between 0 0.9 recurring and 1? We can't just tack another 9 to the end, because there's already an infinite number of 9s, and if we try to use the digit less than 9 at the end, then the number is less than 0 0.9 recurring rather than greater. If we can't fit a single real number between 0 0.9 recurring and 1, let alone infinite numbers of them, then they have to be the same number. Still not convinced? Well, here's quite probably the most simple proof. It's well established that 1 third equals 0 0.3 recurring. If we multiply that by 3, we get 3 thirds equals 0 0.9 recurring. But the fraction 3 thirds can be simplified to the number 1, so 1 equals 0 0.9 recurring. It seems counterintuitive because the numbers look so different, but they are, in fact, the same. Now, this is the most counterintuitive thing that we're going to be covering today, and the one most likely to generate angry YouTube comments, but an infinite number of $1 bills and an infinite number of $20 bills have the same value. It sounds impossible. I mean, the $20 bill is worth 20 times as much as the $1 bill, and there are different sizes of infinity, so how could both piles of infinite money be worth the same? Well, to answer this, let's reorganize the $1 bills a bit. There are multiple ways to do this, but let's just wrap an elastic around every 20 $1 bills. Once all infinity $1 bills are grouped up into bundles of 20, we can simply pair them off with the $20 bills. This creates a one-to-one -one pairing between each of the different sets of infinite bills. Because such a pairing can be created, these infinities are said to have the same cardinality or size. To some people, it may still seem like a pile of $20 bills is worth more. After all, you're going through the $1 bills 20 times as fast, so surely it's going to run out of those first. Of course, that's just not how infinity works. Infinity isn't some arbitrarily large number that comes after the largest number that you can think of. It's not actually a number at all. It is the set of all other numbers of which there is no limit. And because we can create a one-to-one -one pairing between each stack of money, it can't be said that the $20 bills will approach infinity faster either. These properties of countable infinities can lead to some extremely bizarre and unintuitive results, such as a variation of the Ross Littlewood paradox. But this paradox, start with an empty box. At each step, you add a ping pong ball labeled with a number. Then, if that number is a perfect square, remove its square root. The first step is to add ball one, then remove it because it is its own square root. Then we add ball two, then three, and on the next step we add ball four, but remove ball two since four is two squared. Once this process is repeated infinite times, how many balls will be in the box? Now, the obvious answer seems to be that there will be an infinite number of balls. On each individual step, we're either adding one ball or both adding and removing one ball, so it seems like the total number of balls would only ever increase. However, once this process was completed, the box would actually be empty. This is, again, because of the one-to-one -one pairing between each number and its square. It seems impossible for the box to be empty, so let's simplify the process to a single step to make the answer easier to understand. Instead of adding the balls one at a time, just fill the box with the infinite set of balls all at once. Then remove every number that can be squared. Since all numbers can be squared, re-remove all of the balls. This shows us both that there is the same number of whole numbers as there are perfect squares, and that infinity is really weird and confusing. Oh, what's in the box?
Now, you probably heard the story that you can't fold a piece of paper in half more than seven times. This is true for a standard sized piece of paper, but with a large enough sheet of paper, it does become possible. When Mythbusters tackled this tale, they were able to fold paper 11 times. Of course, in order to do this, they required an initial sheet of paper the size of a football field, a steamroller, and a forklift. But if you had a large enough sheet of paper and folded it 42 times, its height would reach the moon. This is because folding paper is an example of exponential growth. When you fold a sheet of paper in half, it creates a second layer, thus doubling the thickness. Folding it in half again, and both layers will be doubled, creating four layers of paper and four times the original thickness. If you have any experience with exponential growth, it should come as no surprise that this gets out of hand really quickly. A standard sheet of paper is 0.1 millimeters thick, so a single fold will make it 0.2 millimeters thick. After two folds, it becomes 0.4, three folds, 0.8, 4 folds 1.6, 5 folds 3.2, 6 folds 6.4, 7 folds 12.8, 8 folds 25.6, 9 folds 51.2, 10 folds is 102.4, which we'll just round out to 100 millimeters for simplicity's sake. Since this is in millimeters, that still doesn't sound like a whole lot. After 10 folds, it's only 0.1 meters, that's about 4 inches. However, our starting point was only 0.1 millimeter, so the height of the paper has actually increased by a factor of a thousand. Technically, it's a factor of 1024 since we're still working with powers of two, but we'll stick with round numbers. And this same thing happens every 10 folds. So after 20 folds, our 0.1 meter becomes 0.1 kilometers. After 30 folds, it becomes 100 kilometers. After 40 folds, it becomes 100,000 kilometers. That just leaves fold 41, which gets us to 200,000 kilometers, and fold 42, which takes us to 400,000 kilometers. If we hadn't rounded down, it would actually be 440,000 kilometers. This well exceeds the distance from the Earth to the Moon, which averages about 384,000 kilometers. Of course, folding a sheet of paper 42 times wouldn't be physically possible in any practical sense, but if you wanted to witness exponential growth in action yourself, there's a much more practical way to conduct this experiment. You can put a sheet of paper on the ground, then attempt to double the size of the stack 42 times. This won't be possible either, but you would make it a lot further in the process than you could by attempting to fold paper.